The plain and slightly dilapidated Georgian exterior of No. 50 Berkeley Square belies an interior that still retains much of its 18th century grandeur. The building possesses a distinct air of timelessness, and you wouldn't be in the least bit surprised if a lady in an open-fronted mantua or a gentleman in knee breeches and a full-skirted knee-length silk jacket were to come marching out of its front door en route to some long-ago society ball. From 1938 to 2015, the building was the premises of Mags Brothers, dealers in rare books, manuscripts and autographs, and the ceiling-high rows of heavy mahogany bookcases that lined the walls were stacked with shelf after shelf of weighty tomes by long-dead men of letters, some famous, many forgotten. But there was nothing in the yellowed pages of the hundreds of books on display that came close to matching the terrifying and inexplicable happenings that were reputedly once a regular occurrence within the walls of the house. Happenings so uncanny that by the early 20th century, 50 Berkeley Square had become universally acknowledged as the most haunted house in London. Quite when the building actually acquired its chilling designation is difficult to ascertain. Charles Harper, in his book Haunted Houses, published in 1907, wrote that The famous haunted house in Berkeley Square was long one of those things that no country cousin come up from the provinces to London on sightseeing bent ever willingly missed. So the property's supernatural reputation had certainly become established by the early 20th century. Charles Harper was non-committal about exactly who or what the spectral presence was that awaited country cousins when they had made their way to Berkeley Square, observing simply that it seems that a something or other very terrible indeed haunts or did haunt a particular room. This unnamed raw head and bloody bones, or whatever it is, has been sufficiently awful to have caused the death in convulsions of at least two foolhardy persons who have dared to sleep in that chamber. He then went on to provide readers with a possible explanation as to how the house had acquired its preeminence amongst London's haunted abodes. Years ago, it was indubitably unoccupied and sufficiently forlorn. But there are those who declare it was never haunted and that the story was indeed invented by a more or less popular novelist of years ago. It is uncertain which popular novelist of years ago Charles Harper had in mind as the inventor of the story. There are in fact two possible contenders. Several books on haunted London claim that it was Edward Bulwer-Lytton who in 1859 had penned a ghost story titled The Haunted and the Haunters, or The House and the Brain. Bulwer-Lytton, incidentally, was the author who in 1830 had published the novel Paul Clifford, which began with the melodramatic opener It was a dark and stormy night, which, according to Writer's Digest, is the literary poster child for bad story starters. So if anyone was going to put a haunted house on the paranormal map of London, Sir Edward Bulwer-Lytton was the man to do it. In addition, he had actually had a large house of his own at the eastern end of Charles Street, just a few doors down from 50 Berkeley Square. Unfortunately, there is no actual proof that the property Bulwer-Lytton had in mind was number 50 Berkeley Square. Indeed, he describes his house as being on the north side of Oxford Street, whereas Berkeley Square is a good eight to ten minutes' walk from the south side of Oxford Street. The second and likelier contender was the Welsh novelist Rhoda Broughton, whose 1873 collection of ghost stories, Tales for Christmas Eve, also known as Twilight Stories, featured a story titled The Truth, The Whole Truth, and Nothing But The Truth. The story had originally appeared in the literary magazine Temple Bar in February 1868, but its inclusion in this compendium helped it reach a much wider audience. The story is written as a series of letters exchanged between a Mrs. Bessie DeWint and Mrs. Cecilia Montresor. In the first letter, dated May the 5th, we learn that Mrs. DeWint has been house hunting in London for her friend Mrs. Montresor and her husband Henry, who are returning to live in London. 
Mrs. De Wint has written to Mrs. Montresor to tell her how, having looked over every undesirable residence in West London, she has at last found what she calls a small compartment of heaven at 32 in an unnamed street in Mayfair. She mentions that she was somewhat surprised when the woman showing her the house told her that the rent would be a mere £300 a year. A feather would have knocked me down. I could hardly believe my ears and made the woman repeat it several times that there might be no mistake. To this hour it is a mystery to me. She ends the letter by telling her friend to give thanks to the saints for having provided you with a palace at the cost of a hovel. Cecilia, having moved in, writes back to say how delighted she is with the property, although, she observes, the mystery of the rent is still a mystery. But by her next letter, dated May the 27th, Cecilia has discovered the reason why the rent is so low, and her tone has changed dramatically. Oh, my dearest Bessie, how I wish we were out of this dreadful, dreadful house! Please don't think me very ungrateful for saying this, after your taking such pains to provide us with a heaven upon earth as you thought. She then goes on to explain how Benson, her maid, had come to her about ten days ago with a very long face and had asked her if she knew that the house was haunted. The cook, it transpires, had visited the local grocer's shop that morning, and on telling him which address to deliver the groceries to, she had been somewhat taken aback when he had said, with a very peculiar smile, Number 32, eh? I wonder how long you'll stand it. Last lot held out just a fortnight. He looked so odd that she asked him what he meant, but he only said, Oh, nothing. Only that parties never do stay long at 32. He had, he said, known parties go in one day and out the next, and during the last four years he had never known any remain for over a month. Feeling a good deal alarmed by this information, she naturally inquired the reason, but he declined to give it, saying that if she had not found it out for herself, she had much better leave it alone, as it would only frighten her out of her wits, and on her insisting and urging him, she could only extract from him that the house had such a villainously bad name that the owners were glad to let it from mere song. This revelation had caused Cecilia some consternation, and the moment her husband Henry arrived home, she blurted out what the maid had told her. He merely laughed at the suggestion that the house was haunted, and derided her babyish fears. But things were about to take a turn for the worse. Not long afterwards, Cecilia continued in her letter, a guest by the name of Adela, who may have been Cecilia's sister or a friend, the story doesn't actually specify the nature of their relationship, was due to come and stay, and Cecilia asked the housemaid to go up to what was to be Adela's room and put sheets on the bed. A few minutes later, Cecilia went up to place some flowers in the room. On entering, a sort of shiver passed over her, and, feeling frightened, she looked up quickly. The girl was standing by the bed, she wrote to Bessie, leaning forward a little, with her hands clenched in each other, rigid, every nerve tense, her eyes wide open, starting out of her head, and a look of unutterable stony horror in them. Her cheeks and mouth not pale, but livid as those of one that died a while ago in mortal pain. As I looked at her, her lips moved a little, and an awful hoarse voice, not like hers in the least, said, Oh my God, I have seen it! And then she fell down suddenly, like a log with a heavy noise. Benson had heard the commotion, and came running to the room, where she helped her mistress lift her fellow servant onto the bed, and here she lay insensible, despite strenuous efforts to revive her. At the end of two hours, Cecilia continued in her letter to Bessie, we succeeded in bringing her back to sensation and life, but only to make the awful discovery that she was raving mad. She became so violent that it required all the combined strength of Harry and Phillips, our butler, to hold her down in the bed. Of course, we sent off instantly for a doctor, who, on her growing a little calmer towards evening, removed her in a cab to his own house. He has just been here to tell me that she is now pretty quiet, 
not from any return to sanity, but from sheer exhaustion. We are, of course, utterly in the dark as to what she saw, and her ravings are far too disconnected and unintelligible to afford us the slightest clue. In a later letter, dated the 12th of June, and addressed from 5 Bolton Street, Piccadilly, Cecilia reveals that they have moved out of that terrible, hateful, fatal house, exclaiming, Oh, my dear Bessie, I shall never be the same woman again if I live to be a hundred. The maid, she informs her friend, has been removed to a lunatic asylum, where she has had several lucid intervals, and during them has been closely, pressingly questioned as to what it was she saw, but she has maintained an absolute hopeless silence, and only shudders, moans, and hides her face in her hands when the subject is broached. But it transpires that an even more terrible event lay behind their decision to move house. One afternoon, having visited the maid at the asylum, Cecilia had returned home, and was sitting with Adela when a young man by the name of Ralph Gordon, an army officer, who it is hinted is courting Adela, came to visit. He was sceptical that a ghost could have driven the maid insane, and he proposed that he would spend the night in the room in order to prove that the house was not haunted. Let me come here tonight and sleep in that room, he demanded. With the gas lit and a poker, I'll engage to exorcise every demon that shows his ugly nose. The two women tried desperately to dissuade him, but he was insistent, and at length Cecilia had agreed to his request. Adela was still fearful. Oh, don't, she said hurriedly. Please don't. Why should you run such a risk? How do you know that you might not be sent mad too? <laughs> Never fear, he laughed. It would take a whole squadron of departed ones, with the old gentleman at their head, to send me crazy. That night he returned with a fellow officer by the name of Captain Burton. The two women again begged him not to go through with his plan, but Ralph Gordon brushed aside their worries. Cecilia continued her account in her letter to Bessie. Let me go up at once, he said, looking very happy and animated. I don't know when I have felt in such good tune. A new sensation is a luxury not to be had every day of one's life. Turn the gas up as high as it will go, provide a good stout poker, and leave the issue to Providence and me. He then told them that should anything untoward occur, he would ring the bell to alert them. However, he was most specific that they were not to come on the first ring. If I ring once, don't come. I may be flurried and lay hold of the bell without thinking. If I ring twice, come. So saying, he headed jauntily up the stairs, leaving the two ladies and Captain Burton downstairs. Just as the clock began to strike eleven, a sharp ting-ting-ting rang clear and shrill through the house. The two ladies jumped up to run upstairs, but Captain Burton barred their way, telling them, No, you must not go. Remember Gordon told us distinctly, if he rang once, not to come. I know the sort of fellow he is, and that nothing would annoy him more than having his directions disregarded. But ten minutes later, loud, sudden, violent, the bell rang again. We made a simultaneous rush to the door, Cecilia writes. I don't think we were one second flying upstairs. Addie was first. Almost simultaneously, she and I burst into the room. There he was, standing in the middle of the floor, rigid, petrified, with that same look, that look that is burnt into my heart in letters of fire, of awful, unspeakable, stony fear on his brave young face. For one instant he stood thus, then, stretching out his arms stiffly before him, he groaned in a terrible, husky voice, Oh my God, I have seen it! and fell down dead, yes, dead, not in a swoon or in a fit, but dead. Vainly we tried to bring back the life to that strong young heart. It will never come back again till that day when the earth and the sea give up the dead that are therein. I cannot see the page for the tears that are blinding me. He was such a dear fellow. I can't write any more today. You're broken-hearted. 
Cecilia. I have quoted from Rhoda Broughton's story at length because accounts of both these mysterious and terrible deaths have appeared almost verbatim in virtually every book or article that have featured the hauntings at 50 Barclay Square, and they are stated as having actually happened inside number 50, despite the fact that the story was fiction and the house, although located in Mayfair, was given as number 32 in an unnamed street. So Rhoda Broughton's story is almost certainly the inspiration for two of the best-known paranormal tales about the house. However, it would appear that 50 Barclay Square had already acquired its haunted reputation by the time Rhoda Broughton came to write her story, so it is possible that it was tales about the house that inspired her ghostly tale. Whatever the origins of its supernatural reputation, the fact remains that by the early 1870s, rumours were circulating in the neighbourhood that something otherworldly and awful lurked within the walls of a house in Barclay Square. On Friday the 20th of December 1872, John Smith, who also went by the name of Wilson and who was described by the newspapers as being a tall, respectable-looking man, appeared before Mr Knox, the magistrate at Marlborough Street Police Court, charged with being drunk and disorderly. According to the evidence given by the police constable who had arrested him, he had been on duty in Barclay Square when he saw the accused ringing the doorbell of a house. He approached Smith and asked him what he was doing, to which the accused replied that he had been told that the house was haunted and he wanted to see for himself whether it was or not. As the defendant was drunk and refused to go away, the constable took him into custody. Testifying in his own defence, John Smith told the court that reports had got about that a house in Barclay Square was haunted and he had taken the liberty of ringing the bell to ask if there was any truth in the reports. He denied having been drunk and said that he had been perfectly sensible at the time and had asked the constable whether he had not heard reports of the nature he had spoken of. Mr Knox was not in the least bit impressed with the would-be ghost hunter and fined him ten shillings, or seven days, in default. Four years later, the Illustrated Police News on Saturday the 23rd of December 1876 published an extensive article under the headline the alleged haunted mansion of Barclay Square, which informed readers that the tradition of paranormal activity within the house was an old one. There is, the article began, in Barclay Square, a fine old mansion, which up to the present time and for very many years past has been constantly pointed out as the haunted house. The article then went on to observe that, like many other mansions in the aristocratic locality, its yearly value, if let, would be about £500 per annum. It has, however, been closed to all comers and has been allowed to grow externally into a neglected and deserted appearance. Numbers of persons have been in the habit of visiting the square for the purpose of even seeing the exterior because the report has been so very generally current that strange, unaccountable rappings and noises have for years been heard in the house, and after midnight, a strange, mysterious figure has been seen flitting about the rooms. It is stated by many of the very old inhabitants of the locality that the story of the haunted house in Barclay Square has been talked of as long as they can remember, and that they have heard their fathers say that there was some talk of a frightful tragedy there at one time, and talk of a ghost, and that the noises at the house used to be dreadful, but what the particulars were, they could not recollect. They further assert that they have often heard that after the tragedy, no one dared sleep in the house, there were such constant rappings. The article then went on to give details of a brave, some might say foolhardy gentleman, who, believing that the noises came from some explainable cause, got permission to sleep in the house one night, accompanied by his valet. The plan was that the gentleman would sleep in the room from which the noises were said to emanate, and his valet would sleep in another. The following morning, the valet found his master dead in bed. Such are the traditions, the article continued, which have recently attracted so many persons to visit Barclay Square for the purpose of seeing the large mansion known as the Haunted House. The article then went on to explain how the hauntings may have begun. About thirty years ago, this house was taken by a medical gentleman who was fond of scientific investigations. 
He had only been there for about three months when he invited some friends to witness the effects of provings on himself. But to their horror, he died under the administration, and after his death the house became vacant for some time. It was afterwards taken by a very wealthy but exceedingly eccentric gentleman named Myers. When he had purchased it, he ordered extensive additions and alterations to be made to the place from an approved plan. He also ordered it to be fitted up in the most costly manner with antique furniture. His peculiarities took many forms, but one of the chief was that he would not be seen by anyone, especially by tradespeople or the workmen. During the fitting up he kept servants in the house, but lived somewhere else in the neighbourhood himself. The servants were under strict orders to be in bed every night by ten, locked in their respective rooms. He would go to investigate the work only at midnight, and thus he acquired the name of the mysterious man. Dressed in a very eccentric manner of an antiquated style, he used to let himself in with a private key, and be seen through the windows in the dead of night from the square, going all about the place like a spectre, with an old-fashioned horn-lantern in his hand. Crowds used to assemble nightly to see this strange, mysterious figure going about the rooms, and eventually he got the name of the ghost. It is stated that he had been engaged to be married, but to his disappointment it had been broken off. He eventually went to live there, where he kept himself in strict seclusion, but keeping up as long as he could the habit of walking the rooms at night till he eventually became bedridden and the walkings of the alleged spectre ceased. The old gentleman died about two years ago, but the house has been shut up to all visitors for nearly a quarter of a century. This marks one of the first appearances, in print at least, of another important character in the folklore associated with 50 Barclay Square, the reclusive Mr. Myers, who, having been jilted by his fiancée, took to wandering the house in the dead of night. Over the next three years, the various threads about the paranormal activity fictional or otherwise, at 50 Barclay Square, would be pulled together to create what has since become a more or less definitive record of the house's haunted history. Writing in the journal Notes and Queries in 1879, W. E. Howlett laid out its sinister credentials. The house in Barclay Square contains at least one room of which the atmosphere is supernaturally fatal to body and mind, and rumours are told of many cases ending in death, madness, or both as a result of sleeping or trying to sleep in that room. He went on to explain that the very party walls of the house when touched are found saturated with electric horror. In May 1879, the weekly magazine Mayfair began a series of articles about the house which well and truly sealed its reputation and which brought together several previously published stories and articles. Barclay Square, especially in dull weather, the first article began, is apt to inspire some of the ghostly feeling appropriate to its aristocratic character. It went on to describe the house's appearance for the benefit of those who might not be able to view it for themselves. The most inattentive eyes cannot fail to be drawn by the aspect of one of the houses on the west side. The number is needless, for the house is unique, unmistakable, and alone in its outer desolation. It was, the article continued, a valuable house left seemingly to decay, with windows caked and blackened by dust full of silence and emptiness. The article then told the story of a newly arrived maidservant who was given one of the upper rooms. In the dead of night, the household was awoken by fearful screams from the new servant's room, and she was found standing in the middle of the floor, as rigid as a corpse, with hideously glaring eyes. She had suddenly become a hopeless and raving madwoman, who never found a lucid interval wherein to tell what had made her so. Of course, this is so like the account of the maid being driven mad by the terrifying entity in Rhoda Broughton's The Truth, The Whole Truth, and Nothing But The Truth, that the truth is, it could almost be the same story. But there was more. 
Some little time afterwards, the article continued, a guest arrived when the house was full of visitors, and he, not unnaturally, laughing at such a skeleton in the cupboard, eagerly volunteered for the room which all others were so shy of entering. It was arranged that, if after a certain time he rang the bell of the room once, it was to be a sign that he found himself as comfortable as expected. But if he rang it twice, someone should come up and see what was the matter. Can you see where this is going? Yes, you've guessed it. At the end of the given time, the bell rang once only. But presently, the same bell gave a frantic peal, and those who ran to his aid found the ghost defier a corpse where the girl had gone mad before, and dead men tell no tales. Now, to paraphrase Oscar Wilde, to lose one character in the same circumstances in two stories may be regarded as a misfortune. To lose two looks like plagiarism. But Mayfair magazine had suggested that the deaths of the maid and the fearless though foolhardy young man had happened inside number 50 Barclay Square, and for the next 140 years, most accounts of the house's hauntings would follow suit and repeat the events described in Rhoda Broughton's story almost verbatim as having happened at this address. The Mayfair article continued that a lady of high position had called at the house one day with a view to leasing it. Having knocked on its door, she waited until it was eventually opened by an old woman who held the door in such a manner as to prevent any possibility of entrance. The old woman told the prospective tenant that the house was not to be let at all. She and her husband lived in it as caretakers. The landlord, unnamed by her, visited the house every six months, and then he would always lock the old couple in one of the lower rooms and go to an upper room which he always kept locked and to which only he had the key. What he did in there, the article continued, is left to surmise. It concluded with a challenge to the mysterious landlord. The best exorcism is publicity and if the owner of the house in Barclay Square does not really wish his property to run to waste, we have given him the best opportunity he can ask for of contradicting every word here written. The challenge went unanswered, and the house continued to feature in the paranormal literature of the age. One story told of how Lord Littleton opted to spend the night in the haunted room. Well aware of the fate that had befallen those who had done so before, he armed himself with two large-bore shotguns loaded with buckshot and silver sixpences, the latter intended to protect him from any malevolent force that might attack him in the night. In the dead of night, something lurched at him from the darkness, and he fired one of his weapons at it, whereupon it fell to the floor with a thud. But the next day there was no trace of the thing he was certain he had shot. Another told of a young girl who was supposed to have been either tortured or frightened to death in the nursery of the house, and ever after her sobbing wraith, clad in a scotch plaid frock, was said to drift down the stairs, wringing its hands in spectral distress. In 1880, yet another tale relates, a ball was given at number 49 next door. A lady and her partner were leaning against the partition wall, when on a sudden she moved from her place and looked around. The gentleman was just going to ask the reason when he felt compelled to do the same. On comparing their impressions, both had felt very cold and had fancied someone was looking over their shoulders from the wall behind. On yet another occasion, the house was furnished for a newly married couple who were to occupy it on their return from their honeymoon. Just before they were expected back, the mother-in-law arrived to put the house in order for them. The first night she slept in the house, her maid heard a scream, and going into her mistress's bedroom, she found her quite dead in bed. A little while later, a man and his dog arrived to spend the night in the haunted room. On arrival, the dog point-blank refused to enter the house and had to be carried in against its will. The enthusiastic ghost hunter and his less enthusiastic canine duly settled down to spend the night in the haunted room, and the next morning both of them were found dead, the dog appearing to have been strangled. And the stories grew steadily more frightening. 
There was the one about a Mr. Bentley leasing the house and moving in with his two teenage daughters, one of whom complained of a strange musty smell in the house, which she compared to that of the animal cages at the zoo. The elder daughter's fiancé, Captain Kentfield, was due to come to stay shortly after they had moved in, and the evening before his arrival, the maid was sent up to what was to be his room to put fresh sheets on his bed. Evidently, the maid had not read Rhoda Broughton's Tales for Christmas Eve, or she would have thrown down the sheets and resigned on the spot. But she hadn't, and up she went, and it wasn't long before the family heard screams coming from the room. Racing upstairs, they found the poor girl collapsed on the floor, murmuring, Don't let it touch me! However, in this version, she died in the hospital the following morning. When he arrived, Captain Kentfield, who was apparently also unfamiliar with the works of Rhoda Broughton, announced his determination to sleep in the room, and, well, let's cut a long story short here, he died of fright having encountered whatever the entity was that was lurking in its shadows. You'd have thought that by this time they would have made Tales for Christmas Eve required reading for anyone, be they maid or officer, before they set foot in that room at 50 Barclay Square. But the house was about to acquire a formidable tenant who would prove more than a match for whatever hideous entities were lurking inside the building. On Saturday the 28th of June, 1884, the York Herald reported that the long-celebrated and much-talked-of haunted house number 50 Barclay Square has at last found a tenant. It has been taken by Lord Selkirk and the British workman with his scaffolding poles is now in possession. Soon after he and his wife, Cicely Louisa, Countess of Selkirk, had moved in, a maid was sent up to put sheets on the bed in an upstairs room, and a few minutes later... No, just kidding. Lord Selkirk didn't get to enjoy his new London home for long, as he died, of natural causes might I add, at his house on St Mary's Isle in Scotland on the 11th of April 1885, and thereafter his wife maintained the house as a London residence until her death in 1920. The Countess of Selkirk had little time for tales of ghosts causing army officers and maidservants to be bumped off in the night. Indeed, according to an article which appeared in the Tatler on Wednesday the 23rd of April, 1902, she is fortunate in not being troubled with nervous terrors, as her friend said, when she took the so-called haunted house in Barclay Square and undertook to clear its reputation, which she did most thoroughly. The fact is that she is brave, sincere and believing, and has no storehouse of imaginary fears. In fact, the Countess was so successful in cleansing the house of its ghostly inhabitants, or at least of belief in them, that Charles Harper, in Haunted Houses, began his entry on it by conceding that it is no longer haunted. He then went on to recount some of the stories that had accumulated around the house in days gone by. There was the man who, undeterred by the fate of earlier victims, had opted to spend the night in the haunted room. Before retiring to bed, he gave some parting instructions to those who occupied the rest of the house. If I ring once, take no notice, for I might perhaps be only nervous without due cause. Well, I'm sure you can finish the story for yourselves by now. In 1909, that weaver of wondrously weird tales, Elliot O'Donnell, published an article in the Tatler in which he revealed that he had received a letter from a reader of his book, Some Haunted Houses of England and Wales, who wished to impart his own traumatic supernatural encounter at 50 Barclay Square to him. O'Donnell duly met with the man and listened intently as he recounted his terrifying experience. He, and a doctor friend of his by the name of Leslie Merrick, had, he said, been anxious to investigate the hauntings in Barclay Square, and they were delighted beyond measure when the owner of the house invited them to spend a night there. O'Donnell didn't reveal the number of the house, possibly for fear of incurring the wrath of the Countess of Selkirk, or possibly for fear of receiving a writ from her lawyers, as house owners were starting to sue newspapers and authors who had claimed that their houses were haunted. We had set apart the evening of November the 5th for our enterprise, the man told O'Donnell, and we arrived at the house about eight o'clock. Neither of us had any idea as to the nature of the hauntings, nor did we for one moment think the phenomena could be other than phantasms of the dead, 
We had no notion of any other type of ghost. We explored the gloomy house from top to bottom, eventually deciding to spend the night in a large back bedroom, which we both agreed was the most likely-looking spot for a ghostly visitation. We made ourselves as comfortable as the circumstances permitted, Merrick selecting the bed, a tremendous old four-poster for his post of observation, and I an ottoman at the foot of it. We shut the door and waited. The atmosphere grew steadily colder as the night advanced. At midnight it must have been freezing. An irrepressible tremor now pervaded my frame. I felt sure we were no longer alone in the house, but that something, something, Mr. O'Donnell, to which I could not assign a name, had suddenly and surreptitiously entered the lower premises. I glanced at Merrick. The lantern was shaking in his hand. His face was ghastly. Out of the indefinable there at length developed something definite, a sound on the staircase, soft, heavy, and suggestive of a crawling horror. It ascended slowly, nearer and nearer. I felt obliged to look at Merrick. His lantern was fully turned on the door. It no longer shook. He had controlled his agitation by a mighty effort, but his eyes were dreadful. The soft tread reached the top stair. It crossed the landing. It halted outside our door. The handle turned. I swear I saw its turn. And the thing entered. I did not see it. I could not see it. I was afraid to look. I heard it approach Merrick. Tread, tread, tread across the soft carpet towards the bed. Merrick saw it, and as I looked at him, my blood froze. I can't get his face out of my mind. It haunts me now. The terror in it was appalling, hellish, damnable. It was not Merrick. It was the thing he saw. It was reflected in his countenance. He was a blurred edition of it. I watched his mouth open. I knew he was endeavouring to shriek for help. I understood his inability to do so. The thing crawled up to him. He tried to beat it off. It wriggled on the bed. It squirmed over him. It came for me. I fled. God forgive me, Mr. O'Donnell. I fled. A policeman was at hand. I told him, and we entered the house together. Merrick was lying face down on the bed, insensible. The thing had gone. No, he didn't die, at least not just then, Mr. O'Donnell. But he lost his reason and a few months later developed internal cancer, which proved fatal. I have since learned that other people who either lived in the house or merely visited it died of the same disease, sarcoma. This was, of course, a new addition to the ghostly tales about 50 Barclay Square, and Elliot O'Donnell, fearless ghost hunter that he was, sought and was granted permission to spend a night in the haunted room, accompanied by a large black cat, explaining the presence of the latter by informing his readers that cats are susceptible both to the superphysical and to sarcoma. Well, you live and learn. And just to be sure that the cat wouldn't take fright and scarper if it encountered the fearful entity that lurked in the house's darker recesses, O'Donnell tied it to the bed to prevent it running off like, well, a scaredy cat. Since Elliot O'Donnell was the doyen of dark tales, it would be to say the least disappointing for his readers if he simply enjoyed a peaceful night and emerged from the room refreshed and rested the next morning. And sure enough, the house's spectral inhabitant was likewise eager not to disappoint. As the clock struck twelve, O'Donnell wrote, I was convulsed with a paroxysm of the most unaccountable, ungovernable terror. A soft tread crossed the hall and began to ascend the stairs. Overpowered by my feelings, I now sprang to my feet and, pushing a chair in front of me, prepared for the worst. Up, 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 four more steps, three, two, one, the landing, halfway across, the door, my door, my God, it is entering. What is it? Oh, what is it? I looked at Pussy. She had sprung to her feet in the greatest state of agitation, her hair bristling on end, her mouth wide open, her eyes all pupil. I am psychic. Ghosts invariably show themselves to me. And I saw this one. 
What it was I cannot say, save that it resembled a small man with a large head, bloated, distorted features, and eyes which defy description. They were larger and fuller than those of a human being, yellowish, green, and wholly bestial. The mouth was merely a jagged slit, the head was covered with a mass of matted hair. There were no ears. Its body was nude, green, pulpy, unwholesome, beastly. More I cannot say, save that it crawled on all fours and had two additional arms, or what resembled arms, instead of legs. It fixed its hideous gaze on the bed and crawled towards it. The cat grew frantic. Again and again it essayed to break the bonds with which I had so securely tied it to the bed. It mewed, it screamed, it foamed, it tore the air wildly with its claws, and as two loathsome hands closed over it, it fell on its back and fought. Now was my opportunity, my only chance. A minute more and the phantasm would turn its attention to me. I darted round the bed, I rushed at the door, I tore it open, and from that cursed, cancer-stricken house I fled for dear life. Anxious that his readers should appreciate the full horror of the thing that he had bravely let the cat do desperate battle with, and to which, let's be frank, he had willingly and disgracefully sacrificed the faithful feline in the pursuit of his own self-preservation, O'Donnell obligingly provided a rough sketch of what the thing looked like. Creepy, indeed. O'Donnell's story reignited interest in the haunted house in Barclay Square and various versions of the already published stories began to circulate once more. In 1912, Miss Jessie Adelaide Middleton published The Grey Ghost Book, in which she conducted a thorough investigation of the history of the paranormal activity that had reputedly taken place inside the house. Acknowledging that the majority of the ghostly tales about the building had originated with Rhoda Broughton, Jessie Middleton decided to write to the source to ask if she could possibly throw any light upon the affair. Back came the following reply. I am afraid that I cannot be of any help in the matter to which you refer. If my name was connected with the so-called mystery of Barclay Square, it is through an error which probably arose from the fact that many years ago I placed the scene of a ghost story which I wrote in a street in Mayfair. Regretting my inability to assist you, I am, yours faithfully, Rhoda Broughton. Unperturbed, Jessie boldly approached the citadel itself and wrote to the current tenant, the Countess of Selkirk, to ask whether she or any of her household had ever seen or heard anything extraordinary or uncanny. Replying that there is no ghost and no mystery, the Countess invited her to come and hear the origin of the tales, if you care to do so. It was a bright morning in May, Jessie Middleton wrote in the Grey Ghost Book, when I went to Barclay Square to have my fond hopes shattered. Notwithstanding the tone of Lady Selkirk's letter as regarding the haunting, I felt a thrill pass through me as I crossed the threshold. I was in the celebrated, haunted house at last. The Countess was very welcoming, but told Jessie that the rumours about the house were naturally annoying. There was not and never had been the slightest truth in any of the many stories which were afloat. Jessie Middleton must have felt herself deflate, as Lady Selkirk informed her that she had been in the house at all hours, and there is absolutely no truth whatever in the statements that it is or ever has been haunted. There is not even a haunted room, and nobody, not excepting the servants, is the least bit nervous or afraid. There is never any difficulty about letting it. This has often been done, and none of the tenants have ever complained of noises and apparitions. So the mystery of Barclay Square resolves itself into nothingness, lamented Jessie Middleton in the Grey Ghost Book. The Tatler, in its review of her book, was beyond inconsolable. That pet ghost story of our childhood, the haunted house in Barclay Square, is exploded for all time. In fact, the house is still inhabited and looks as spick and span as a suburban villa. So now the sole excitement of Barclay Square has evaporated. However, contrary to the Tatler's assertion that the ghost story of Barclay Square had been exploded for all time, 
It was just too good a tale to be left alone, and the house continued to appear in collections of true ghost stories throughout the 20th century. One of the most famous of the modern tales about the house was recounted by Robert Thurston Hopkins in his book Cavalcade of Ghosts, published in 1956. When I first came to London, Hopkins began, in the gaslit 1890s, the whole murky jungle of the streets and houses teemed with suggestions of ghosts and inexplicables. One famous haunted house in the West End was number 50 Berkeley Square, and even in my own memory, sightseers and country cousins frequently found their way to the square to gaze shudderingly at its gaunt and empty front with its sightless windows and rusty iron railings and balustrades. One abominable phantom reigns supreme at number 50. There are several accounts of the appearance of this ghost known as the nameless horror of Berkeley Square and each time it appeared, it brought about the death of people who were foolhardy enough to sleep in the haunted room. The most often quoted record of this monster tells how two sailors found themselves without money or shelter in London one fog-bound snow-blocked night in the Christmas season. The two half-frozen tars at last wandered into Berkeley Square, and when they saw the to-let notice displayed on the unlighted facade of number 50, they decided to break in and spend the night there. Before settling down for the night, they started a fire in the grate. In the dead of night, they were woken from their slumbers by the sound of muffled footsteps which came plop-plopping up the stairs. There was nothing human about those footsteps. Suddenly, something passed through the door with a sudden motion. The sailors leapt up and ran towards the window, where they had left the only weapon they possessed, a rifle. The hideous intruder, with large outspread claws, blocked the door to prevent them escaping down the stairs. And then it began to shuffle towards them, its claws scraping across the bare boards. Suddenly it lunged at the sailor who had grabbed the rifle barrel, intending to use it as a club, causing him to fall back onto the window, which shattered. The other sailor took the opportunity to dash past the hideous entity and make his escape across the landing and down the stairs as fast as his legs would carry him. But halfway down he heard his friend utter a series of terrified, ghastly screams. He made it to the front door, threw it open, and collapsed on the stone steps at the front of the house. Here he was found by a passing policeman who revived him. But on searching the house, the policeman found the dead body of the other sailor, his neck broken, and his eyes were wide open in terror. Robert Thurston Hopkins's book led to a resurgence of interest in 50 Berkeley Square being the most haunted house in London, and over the next 40 years, stories about it continued to appear in books, newspapers and magazines the world over. Many of the stories followed the already established canon. There was the maid preparing a room for a guest when she saw something that was so terrifying that she was unable to speak of it and ended up insane or dead. Then there was the dashing, fearless army officer who pooh-poohed the dire warnings of the fate awaiting those who dared to confront the malevolent spectre with fatal consequences. And of course the two sailors whose endeavours to enjoy a little Christmas shelter ended in tragedy. Interestingly, and I hate to be pedantic about this, suspicious deaths such as those reported to have occurred at 50 Berkeley Square would have required an inquest, if not a full-scale police investigation. And yet there are no newspaper reports of any inquests or investigations ever having taken place into the unexplainable deaths of any maids, army officers or sailors, or for that matter, of anyone actually having died inside the house under mysterious circumstances. Almost every article about the house mentions the fact that because of its sinister reputation, it was unlet for years at a time in the 19th century, despite this being provably untrue. Strange lights that flashed in the windows startling passers-by in the dead of night, disembodied screams that echoed from the depths of the building, and spookier still, the sound of a heavy body being dragged down the staircase have over the years all been added to the folklore of the hauntings, but it is almost impossible to find any first-hand accounts from anybody who actually experienced any of these. During their long tenure here, Mags Brothers had little communication with ghostly visitors, 
according to their official history, Despite many all-night sessions on Firewatch during the Second World War and more recently, there have been no strange reports during the present tenancy, but we still feature in the guidebooks of haunted houses and are used to dealing with a steady flow of inquiries. The guide then goes on to state that there are several different and apparently contradictory tales of the manifestations encountered here. You can take your pick from a pair of legs coming down a chimney, a feathered thing, and the present writer's favourite, the nameless horror. However, there were reports of inexplicable happenings during their tenancy. In a 2001 BBC documentary on Haunted London, one member of staff told how he was working alone in the accounts department, which then occupied the supposed haunted room one Saturday morning when a column of brown mist moved quickly across the room and vanished. That same year, a cleaner preparing the building for a party felt the overwhelming sensation that someone or something was standing behind her. Turning round, she found the room was empty. A man walking up the stairs was shocked when his glasses were snatched from his hand and flung to the ground. Visiting the house today, or at least standing outside it, there is nothing that commemorates its supposed haunted past, nor for that matter does the sight of it elicit cold shudders or feelings of dreadful foreboding. In fact, viewed in the morning or afternoon sunshine, it is a pleasant enough building, and those who pass its door, even during the hours of darkness, Rarely pay it a second glance, if they bother to glance at it at all. A blue plaque on its external wall remembers the tenure of statesman and Prime Minister George Canning, who leased the house for several years, until his death on the 8th of August 1827, and before anyone jumps to any conclusions, he died at Chiswick House, so his demise cannot be attributed to any malevolent force lurking within 50 Barclay Square but such is its reputation that visitors still turn up here to gaze upon its outer walls and to shudder at the tales of its ghostly past. As far as many of them are concerned, it matters little that the tales of horrendous deaths and hideous entities have little to no basis in fact, for to them 50 Barclay Square has been and always will be nothing less than the most haunted house in London. Now, I'm just off to change the bedsheets. Wish me well. <laughs>